This podcast is brought to you thanks to the generous support of Whistler Blackcomb, leaders in delivering adventure. It's a lot easier to take command and control and be in a leadership role. Um, so do I like be, being in a leadership role? Yes. And do I like taking command and control? Yes. I think, I think a lot of us do, which is kind of what leads us into this industry. But, uh, you know, I think to be a leader is, is hard and to, to be a good leader is, is hard. Welcome to Delivering Adventure. This is the podcast that explores what it really takes to share adventure like a pro with your friends, your family, and as a profession. My name is Chris Capio, and I'm coming to you from Whistler, British Columbia. And I'm Jordy Shepard, recording from Canmore, Alberta. After a lifetime of working extensively in different parts of the adventure guiding industry, Chris and I have teamed up to launch this podcast. In each episode, you will hear top adventure guides, managers, marketers, and athletes share their best stories, advice, and trade secrets. The goal of this podcast is to share how you can take yourself and others farther from the mountains to the office and beyond. At some point in time, every group needs someone to step forward to provide direction. If you're a professional guide or instructor, it is pretty much expected that you can be the leader. However, If you are with your friends, family, strangers, or you're part of a team, being the leader may not be as obvious. While many people enjoy the command and control element that can come with being a leader, actually stepping forward and being an effective leader can be difficult. This is especially true when we find ourselves dealing with people who are predisposed to challenge authority. So in this episode, we're joined by Aaron Tierney, who is going to walk us through some of the things that we can do to inspire others, to want to follow us, and how we can aspire ourselves to step forward and take the reins of leadership. Aaron is a certified CSGA ski guide and the current president of the Canadian Ski Guide Association. In addition to guiding in the heli ski industry since 1999, Aaron is also a guide trainer and examiner with the Canadian Ski Guide Institute. Aaron currently works as the general manager of Whistler Heli Skiing. Aaron has worked extensively with teams of guests and guides in a number of roles, which makes her a perfect person to give us some insights into being a leader. Okay, Jordy, let's bring Aaron into the Delivering Adventure studio. And just a note, she did warn us that she has a rather vocal dog, so we may hear that from time to time in the background. Yeah, my dogs are also being a little noisy today too. Hi, Aaron. welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So where are you right now? I am at my home uh, just outside of Pemberton and Mount Curry, British Columbia. Nice. How are things looking there for the season? Perfect heli skiing weather right now. If we only had two or three more meters of snow, we'd be good to go. <laughs> yeah, I find often heli skiing is never perfect, perfect. There's usually something going on that, you know, and even if it's perfect for the guests, we're we're struggling to make it perfect for the guests because there's challenges in the industry. Yeah, I, that's why we call it heli skiing and not powder skiing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> helicopter guaranteed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some days. Please tell us about your path into the adventure industry so our listeners know a little bit about how you got to where you are. Well, I think my my path uh, started probably quite young. Um, I was born or I grew up in uh, downtown Toronto, right in the heart of the city. And I never really kind of felt comfortable there. Um, but we had a cabin that we'd go to on the weekends and uh, in the summer and uh, during the summer as well. And that's definitely where I felt at home and, and comfortable. And from a really young age, I would fill my backpack or my my stick with my bandana with some crackers and cheese and go out across the field or up the up the ski hill and I was uh really happy there. So yeah, I grew up ski racing and uh was doing that and uh quite a focus. And then at 16 I got cut from the team, which I wasn't expecting. Uh kind of came out of left field for me. And so left me a little bit lost and uh 
I didn't really know what to do with myself, but luckily my aunt and uncle had moved to Whistler in the 70s and uh, offered me a spot to come and live with them uh, for the summer, which uh, was amazing and really found people that I, I like to hang out with out here. So I came out to Whistler, um, went to school, finished high school in Pemberton and met a great group of uh, people both at at school and uh, and in the community that love to be out adventuring and having fun. And we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, walked out into the woods and kind of figured it out. And in the winter, we'd put our secure fix on and uh, and go tromp around in the mountains and kind of trial by fire. And um, so I kind of formed my life around uh, working to ski uh, so that I could play and, and have fun. And then uh, that wasn't really fulfilling me um, fully with the jobs that I was doing. So I, I got an opportunity to go work with the Black Home Ski Patrol and that was great for a couple of years. Great group of people, learned a lot from them. Uh, and then one of my friends told me she was going to take a, an, an avalanche course and a guides course. So I decided to, to hook up with her and did my level one CAA course. I had uh, Larry Stanier and Claire Israelson as my instructors. And uh, we actually had Justin Trudeau in the course as a student. Uh, we didn't know who he was at the time, but um, I was just you know, in awe of, of Larry and Claire and their stories that they had to share. And I thought this is something that I can really uh, get behind and, and be involved in. And so from there, I went and did uh, the level one CSGA course in Blue River um, and was successful with that course and offered a, a week of work um, the following week. So I went back up there and it happened to be Mike Wigley's 30th year of operations and Warren Miller's 50th year of, of making movies. And I walked into this week long gala affair, uh, chocolate fountains and ice sculptures and black tie. And we'd go skiing every day. And it was the beginning of May, but so the skiing was awful. It was knee deep isothermic slush. We'd never take guests out into that nowadays. But at the time we went out and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I was hooked from then on. So that was the start of my career. So that's how you got into the adventure industry. And then, yeah, tell us where you've gone from there. Uh, yeah, from there, I, I worked my way up uh, through the operation at, at Wigley's uh, tail guide, guide, lead guide. Um, had a great opportunity when I started lead guiding. I got my level three CSGA course and uh, we had a shortage of lead guides at, at that time and so I was thrown right into the to the big bus into the 212 with uh, multi-group machines and I was doing it all winter long every day and and it was so amazing I, I'm not someone that will sit there and plan out a full day um, I planned out a couple of, a couple of runs a couple of directions that I'd want to go and then just kind of went from idea to idea to idea and um, it was a great adventure and uh and really fun to be out in front and leading the way kind of a, a dream that i'd had since back from before when i was tail guiding and and uh kind of got separated with one other girl who was going to the bathroom and i i guided her down and we ended up passing all the groups and having a great run down this amazing tree run and ended up at the bottom ahead of the lead guide and it was a bit of a mistake at the time, but I got a little glimpse into what it could be like. So it was really cool to, to achieve that. Um, I got the opportunity to be the operations manager at Wigley's. Um, and, uh, and that was a pretty neat thing. Working for Mike Wigley was a, an amazing experience. He's a, a true visionary and an exciting person to work for. Someone who had really, really high standards, who made it easy to actually do a high level of work because that was the, that was the expectation. There was no question about doing anything else. Um, and, uh, became an instructor with the Canadian ski guide association, uh, uh, which I really enjoy and, uh, working up to be the, the president now of the association. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and now I'm working as the general manager of Whistler Heli Skiing. Wow, quite a journey. I started with uh, Weegly's in back in the day. I was a radio operator initially, and then I became a weather forecaster fairly quickly that same season and working with ASARC with uh, the Cal University of Calgary Snow Science program uh, during the days and weather forecasting in the mornings and the evenings. And then uh, 
yeah, and then I ended up starting the, I did some a bit of tail guiding as well. And then I started with the ACMG program and became a mountain guide. So you've been in some leadership roles. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because we are talking today about being a leader and, and uh, what it takes to try and convince other people to follow us. Uh, so what um, kinds of leadership positions have you found yourself in? Well, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that um, as soon as you decide to take a career or a job where you're responsible for people's safety and risk management, that you are, you are volunteering to put yourself into a leadership position right off the bat. Um, and so I think you have to be prepared to, to take on that responsibility really important responsibility. Um, you know, right from, from the time you're a, a tail guide, um, you know, or, or ta- doing a practicum and you're, you're in that role where you're working with the guide, you are in a leadership role. As soon as the guide skis away, you're, you're making sure that the guests are, are following up with, um, with the instructions that the guide has given. And you have a real opportunity to be a leader to the guests as well, whether they're, you know, experts or, or, on the lower end of things, um, you know, understanding where their story is coming from and and why they're there and what they're trying to get out of their trip and and uh, trying to create the experience for them through your leadership skills um, is really important. And then, you know, moving up as a guide and, and a lead guide, you're still take, taking care of the guests, um, of course, but then you're also um, developing your mentorship skills and your leadership skills uh, for the people that are working under you as well. And then I had the opportunity to work uh, as a leader in our operation and then within our association and, and working towards, you know, leadership in, in the industry as well. I think that's the, the path that that's available to, to people. Um, but I do think that it's really important to deter, to establish the difference between a leadership role and being a leader and, you know, being in a leadership role is very much command and control, which you learn early on in, in anything that you're doing professionally. Um, but being a leader takes a really long time to develop. And, you know, I've been in this industry for 28 years or so, and I, I really feel like I'm only beginning to understand what it really means to be a leader and how to actually achieve that. And, seen only you know glimpses of having success of that and a lot of reflection on um, how I could do better how I could have handled the situation uh, differently in order to to you know provide a better leadership role model there well that's awesome thanks for that progression description a lot of people do want to uh, aspire to become leaders and so I think a lot of our audience uh, may be in that position if they're not already a leader. And just in terms of how easy it is or not easy it is, um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about if you found it fairly easy to become a leader and if not, and, and so if, if it was fairly easy to slide into the leadership role, what assisted you with that? And if it wasn't at times, uh, why why was that and what did you do to try and help yourself along? Well, I don't think it's easy to be a, to be a leader in the true sense of, of the word. Um, it's a lot easier to take command and control and be in a leadership role. Um, so do I like be, being in a leadership role? Yes. And do I like taking command and control? Yes. I think, I think a lot of us do, which is kind of what leads us into this industry. Um, but, uh, you know, I think to be a leader is, is hard and to, to be a good leader is, is hard. It's, uh, but I like a challenge. And so I look at this as another uh, step in my, in my career forward. Um, being a leader can be isolating and you have to sometimes make unpopular decisions at times. But I think it's really rewarding to see the change that you can potentially make from, from different positions as you move through your career and in different ways. And I think, uh, being surrounded or exposed to different types of leadership in throughout your career, um, 
is really valuable too, because you learn to see what works, what works for you, what works for other people, the effect that, that leaders have on, on different people. And you can kind of pick and, and glean the gems from that. And I've certainly seen a wide uh, array of, of leadership styles over the years to, to help form my opinion of what a good leader is. Uh, why do you think people in groups actually need leaders or, or do they need leaders? Yeah, I think you know, I thought about this because I've had that suggested to me that maybe we don't need a leader. We can all just go along together and, and make decisions. And But I absolutely think that there needs to be a leader with within the group. So, yeah, so if you want to look at what, what being a leader is, uh, you know, a leader brings people together. They they tell a story and they, they kind of give an initial starting off point. Um, they create a structure and a, and a framework for the team to, to expand upon. Um, so they keep the conversation in check or the objective in check um, and keep people that maybe are potentially going off into left field from going out there and, and bringing them back into place. Um, a leader will summarize the thoughts of, of the group and uh, keep the conversation or the, the objective moving forward to the, to the next level so that you can actually achieve whatever the goal is that you're setting out to do. Um, another big thing I think a leader does, which is something that I try am trying to work on is really, uh, you know, that we talk about leadership role in the beginning being command and control, but relinquishing control and, you know, empowering team members to own p- parts of the project. Um, you know, I think we all like to be involved with things and, and have our hands in the exciting, exciting bits, but I think a good leader is able to step back and let uh, let the team members take take charge and still be there for guidance and, and support, but um, but to be able to to give that power to other people and that allows them to progress their skills and, and build their leadership skills up as well. Um, and I think it's also important to note that in our business, a, a leader takes on a lot of responsibility and. Um, and sometimes has to make hard calls for for safety, safety of the the rescuers, or hard business decisions. And the team that's performing the task, whether it's the development of a of a procedure or a project or or a rescue response, needs to be able to focus on on their task at hand and do the best job that they can do. And the leader's job is to keep an eye on the the politics and the liabilities and the things beyond, so that uh, they can step in and. And support and, and pull the team back if necessary, but it's not impacting the team that's actually doing the work on the ground um, to get things done. So I think that's why it's really important to have a have a, a leader. And if you don't have a leader, find the conversation go tends to go round and round and round and and really move forward at a at a slow rate. Um, and uh, you know, for an example in a rescue scenario. When I was operations manager at Wigley's, um, Saturdays were our changeover days. So we were done at noon, but the thing was you kind of kept your ski stuff on because the reality is, is you're probably going to get called out to help in a rescue at some point in the afternoon um, from the recreational public out there. And being a, a newer leader, uh, I wanted, I still felt like I had to have command and control. And that was how I was going to support my team is kind of by trying to do everything myself. So I went out on a lot of those calls and this one call I went out on, Mike came with us in the helicopter. It was nearing the end of the day, didn't have a lot of daylight left and it was an, it was an injury. Um, and I got out of the helicopter with a whole bunch of senior lead guides and went over and started doing my patient assessment and, and you know, trying to help this, this guy out who was beat up. And at one point I looked over and I saw Mike and he was just standing back against the machine, leaning up against the helicopter and just kind of watching and and this little grin on his face. And he kind of had his signature little bop that he goes with his head, starts nodding. And when he's thinking a lot about a lot of stuff, I was like, okay, I think I'm probably going to hear something from Mike about this a little bit later. He's got some things to say. And he, he took me aside afterwards and he said, Aaron, you are the leader. You can't, run in and get your head in the hole and not keep an eye on the big picture all around you. You need to, you need to step back and let your team do their work and, and you look out for the big picture and safety and, and take care of your, take care of your people. And 
I was like, but I, I still really want to get my hands in there, but I, I get what you're saying. And so that was kind of a, another lesson in the progression <laughs> with Mike to be a leader. Absolutely. And so we know with, uh, with leadership and, you know, you take a look at any industry, you know, whether it's politicians or if it's in business or in the rescue world or guiding, instruction, teaching, uh, like we're talking about here in the adventure world, adventure industry, uh, there's different styles, different leadership styles. What, uh, if you could peg yourself as having a style of leadership, you know, do you have that? Or could you, can you state what that is? And, and does it change depending on the situation? Well, yeah, I could say what I would like my style to be. Um, but like I said, it's a, it's a work, it's a work in progress. Um, it's, uh, I mean, ideally, I think having a collaborative style where you can involve as many people as possible and, and step back and, and relinquish that control and, and give tasks to other people and, and just be there as a, as a, you know, support and, and check in person and, and guidance is, is ideal um, that creates buy-in from the group and, and involvement and everything is going to get done a lot more, um, efficiently, uh, if you can empower people and, and support them that way. Um, I think there is a time for, for command and, and control and more direct or dictatorship, however you want to call it, uh, leadership style. And I think that, uh, I've certainly, you know, I've certainly, do that at times when, when necessary and growing, I'll call it growing up, uh, growing, developing my skills. That was definitely the more prevalent side of things. And I, I learned a lot from that style, uh, what, what doesn't work about that. And I'm really trying to focus on, on being more collaborative and, in, and inclusive at this point. Um, certainly, you know, from starting guiding in the early mid to mid nineties, early two thousands, uh, the, the kind of leadership styles that were modeled back then towards uh, t- towards me and the the other developing guides was was one style, and I think that's changed over the years. and um, And so, with that, I've tried to change as well. So, Aaron, what does it take to convince people to follow us? I'm sure, there's a lot of mountain bike guides and ski and snowboard instructors, parents trying to convince their kids to to follow them there's friends leading their friends there's spouses trying to lead their spouses and to convince them to to do what they want to do like what does it take to get people to say right you're the leader we're we're gonna take your advice and we're gonna follow you where we need to go well i think it's easier to convince people to follow you if you if you're able to come into a situation with uh a reputation and uh you know, and, and skills and have already established that, that trust, um, whether it's directly with the people involved or, or throughout your, your industry or, or, you know, your other relationships. Um, but if that's not the case and you're, you're coming in fresh and meeting people for the first time, or, you know, you're trying to get your children to listen to you or, (laughs) or your friends or your spouse to listen to you, I think having a story that they can get behind, um, really helps um, letting people know the full situation, what you're dealing with. Um, maybe the goal is to go out and do, um, activity X. Um, but these are the conditions that are, that are facing us. And so these are the things we're going to be, this is how we're going to adjust our, our day. This is why we're going to adjust our day. These are the things I'm concerned about. Does anyone else have any concerns, um, engaging, engaging people in the story and, and having them understand why, you know, you, you're sort of going down the path of decision making that that you're going down, um, and then I think it's really important to lead with lead with confidence, but lead with humility. So, like a humble confidence um, that makes you much more approachable and and relatable than someone that comes in and just tries to lay down the law and doesn't doesn't listen to anything else that's going on around them. So. Um, if you can, if you can tell a story, if you can engage people, if you can empower people to be part of the decision making through uh, education, then uh, and lead with some humble confidence, I think you're going to have a good chance of bringing people along with you in a because you're creating such a positive environment. That credibility piece I find is is huge 
if you don't build up that trust in yourself from the people you're trying to lead, it becomes very, very difficult. And I find that if you can build up that credibility early by being right and and getting everything right to start with, then people are less likely to question you if something goes a little bit sideways further on. And that's where making sure that you have done your preparation, you have set those expectations, you're walking into a situation where you're you're ready to go um, versus, hey, we're going to do this thing and you get there and it doesn't work. And then all of a sudden people start questioning whether you are the person who should be leading them or, or not. And that can be really difficult um, to do, actually. It takes a while. And I think that uh, for some people, we were we were speaking with Will Gadd um, not very long ago, and, and he's very, uh, it's probably fairly easy for someone like Will to build up that credibility because he is a pro athlete and he's done a lot of, you know, huge things. But if you are that, if you are that new leader, especially if you're younger than the people that you're, that you're leading, it can be really hard. You know, I see a lot of younger um, ski and snowboard instructors and canoe guides. I train canoe guides in the spring here in Whistler that go into situations where they have some older people and it's really tough for them to establish that credibility. What kind of advice do you have for, for those people in that situation? Yeah, well, unfortunately appearance is, is a big part of it. And, uh, when you're coming in young, especially the older we get, the younger people look <laughs> around us. So uh, even if they're not, uh, you know, it's important to really come in prepared, like you said, and be be confident in a in a humble way. Know your stuff. Um, deliver a good opening introduction. Uh, share some of your experience without being being braggy. Um, and let people know that these are the goals of our objectives and uh, these are the goals of our of our day and uh, this is how we're going to achieve them. These are the things that might be standing in our in our way. And I think if, if you can deliver in the first 5, 10, 15 minutes um, a bit of an introduction that lets people know that you've you've thought things through and you've had experience in this in this world uh, that they're going to they're going to start to listen to you and and maybe even be enthralled by you because you are this younger person living this dream that, that potentially that they, you know, wish that they could have been a part of or want to emulate. And so you can, even as a young person, I think you can, you can win people over if you're prepared and you're professional. It's, you know, professionalism comes down to takes care of so many things. If, if you're prepared and professional, it, it shows people that you are thinking with a risk mindset and that you are, um, you're, coming in with a preventative mindset to, to have a safe but enjoyable adventure and that they feel that they they can put their trust into you and, and go forward with you and take that first step. And then it just builds from there. Yeah, that's awesome advice. So what kinds of mistakes do you tend to see aspiring leaders making? Communication is a, is a big one um, in delivery style. Like I said earlier, um, the delivery styles that were modeled towards me in the early uh, 2000s, late late 1990s uh, are different than what I try and deliver deliver now. Um, so I think it's really important how you how you communicate. I can expand on that if if you want. but um, you know back in the back in the day it was a lot more of a sort of finger in the, the chest shame and blame kind of approach to when you when you messed up or you did something wrong and you know, on one hand, I, I guess I was in it long enough that I do understand that that approach. Um, you know, the the supervising person that sees this this potential error that you've made that maybe you got away with, and and the, but they want you to learn from it, and they see the potential of what could have happened had something not worked out. Um, so there's fear there. They've probably seen some trauma in their in their career, and that translates out in the in the delivery as well. But I know that uh, from both receiving and trying to give feedback that way that, uh, you know, you're not listening generally to the, the great advice that's probably mixed in with that delivery. Um, you're more thinking about how you screwed up and how you're feeling 
the ashamed and uh, also thinking of all the different yeah, but ways that you could probably talk yourself out of talk your way out of it if you're given the chance to to say something. Um, so that that's one one thing I think people make the mistake of is is their delivery. Um, another is uh, as a leader realizing that even though you're a, you're a team, there is a bit of a, a fuzzy line between the, the leader and the team. And you hold that a position of power, whether you recognize it or not, or whether or not you want to be part of the team, you know, be an equal member of the team. If you're in that leadership position, you, you do hold more, more power than, than the rest of the team to some extent. And the words that you use and the, the conversations that you have, the comments that you make can hold a lot more, even if they're just in casual passing, they can hold a lot more weight to the people that are part of the team. And, uh, and so being careful what you say and being potentially maybe a little bit more guarded in your, in your casual conversations, especially if your teammates are friends of yours, um, because that can translate to them as something that's actually absolute and fact Meanwhile, it's just an idea or a thought that you probably maybe had and, you know, still trying to form it. So being, just being careful with your, with your power and your, your delivery for people is something to be aware of. It is hard sometimes to balance direct feedback to people that you're, that you're leading um, versus trying to create what I think is the best way to lead people, which is using a style that makes people feel good about themselves, what they've done and, and how they've done it. And it can be a little bit hard, especially when we're leading people in situations where we don't necessarily have a lot of time to, um, to be soft, right? Like, listen, if you don't do this one thing in the next 10 seconds, we're going to have a, a fairly negative outcome. And so you need to do this right now. And, I find if you can build up that credibility beforehand, then when you are sharp with people or a little bit more direct, then they're they're more likely to cut you a little bit of slack. But if that is your um, if that is your style the whole time to talk down to people, then it's probably not going to work out very well uh, for you. I was just going to say uh, it's certainly situational, and you're right. You you know if you're if you're sharp and harsh all the time, no one's going to listen to you. But there are times certainly when that, that directness comes out and is needed. And, and uh, I don't think people take offense to it at that point. It's, it's more in the, I guess I'm focusing more on the development of, of team and whether that's a group that you're skiing with or being out in the mountains with first and, or working with um, and developing that relationship as a, as a leader. Um, but certainly, yeah, there are times when you have to be direct and, um, and you change your tone and, the, the message comes across clear that this is the time to, to listen. We can talk about this later. Mm -hmm. So while being a leader is necessary, it can be intimidating for some people in certain situations. Um, I shared with you a, a story of how I was leading some university students uh, this past fall on a backpacking trip. And, and some of the people were, it, it was very easy for them to step forward and, and fill a leadership role. And then other people, for the most part, because they had not done that before, um, found it quite difficult and I needed to give them a, a, a few tries uh, at it before they started to feel comfortable to, to step forward and to fill that void. And so what kind of advice do you have for any of our listeners out there who might find it hard to step forward and to be the leader? Well, I think, I think we, all, we also need team members. And so not everybody needs to be a leader. We, we also need team members. Um, and, but I will say that if you were put yourself in a group that as a team member, you have an equal respected voice in, in the say on, on what's going on um, in the decision-making process. So maybe you're not the, you're not feeling comfortable to be the, the full-time leader of the group, but you want to make sure that you're putting yourself in a successful situation where your your voice is count, counts and um, and you are with people that you respect and that respect you back. And then I think over time and experience, you're gonna you're gonna glean th those uh, 
those leadership qualities from those people and be able to apply them into your into your day to day life as you gain that experience um, and become a become a leader yourself. But I don't think that being a leader is something that people need to rush into necessarily if if they're not ready. And I think knowing that they're not ready to be in that leadership role is also a, a real strength as well. And for you know your example, you're talking about in sort of a instructional role where you're trying to develop leadership skills. I think to in order to facilitate that, um, you know, you are going to have those strong personalities, and then you're going to have the people that are more challenged by that, and making the space uh, for those people that are more challenged by it to have that that freedom to, you know, figure things out as as far as leadership goes is is really important too. So as a as a leader of that group making sure that the, the strong personalities understand the importance of kind of stepping back and being quiet and giving that person space to, 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 uh, to try on a leader, a leadership hat and see how that goes can be really uh, imp- impactful for the group. No, that, that is, that is so true. Um, this fall, I was doing a leadership uh, program with, uh, a friend of mine, Bruce Wilson, who has been a guest on our show, and we ran an exercise uh, where we were creating a situation to see who would step forward and be the leader. And once someone got established, then we started removing them from the exercise to give an opportunity for mm-hmm. for other people to come forward. And then as soon as somebody did that, then we would remove them just to create that that space because it is so easy in groups for people to the people that are maybe a little bit more extroverted um, to come forward and, and fill that that void. Uh, and what I do find is the people that are a little bit more introverted and shyer can tend to stay in the back. And um, it is interesting. I do find that sometimes people that are introverted and a little shyer don't think that they can be the leaders when in fact, when I look at guides, a lot of the people that I know that are instructors, skiing, biking, um, guides, mountain guides, whatnot, they're not extroverted people. They're actually introverts. And they re-energize by being a little bit quieter and having their, their quiet time, but they are happy to step forward if it's if it's needed and finding that confidence in yourself to switch switch yourself kind of on when you need to, it, it it's okay. And so if you're an introvert, I guess my my let my advice to you out there is you can be a leader. Like it, it doesn't have to be the person that's big and noisy and, and bold. Yeah. Like, like we've talked about, I think being a, a big part of being a leader is, is being able to listen and to hear other people's stories and, and take that into consideration as you move the conversation forward. So certainly taking a quieter approach can be a real strength um, point of strength. So it's common when we're guiding and instructing adventure sports to find ourselves leading people with strong personalities who may be storming in a group. And what I mean by storming is that they may be pushing the boundaries and testing their leader's authority. This usually happens because they want to do things their own way. Uh, they may also be trying to carve out their position in a group's hierarchy by being a little bit more assertive. And a lot of guides find this challenging. What kind of advice do you have for our listeners who might find themselves in this situation and having a difficult time dealing with these kinds of people? Yeah, those are fun groups. <laughs> uh, I find uh, skiing really fast <laughs> helps, you know, they got to try and keep up. But no, you know, depending on what, what you're doing, um, there's different ways to, to manage those groups. And certainly it's different. I think if you're in a professional role with a group of clients versus a group of friends. Um, but, uh, from a professional standpoint, I would say, you know, for an example, maybe you're, you have a higher avalanche hazard and so you can't access the terrain that people want to go in. So, you know, just that you're less talk, more, more skiing, keep them busy hitting, hitting jumps, having fun and change the focus from, you know, the steep and gnarly terrain to, uh, to, uh, you know, a faster pace and challenge them in, in different ways. Um, I find that, uh, talking to people, especially when you, when you first meet them or, you know, in the lead up to the trip and actually finding out what their goals and objectives are for that particular, that particular experience is really helpful, no matter what the personality type, 
if you take five minutes and talk to someone and say, Hey, what, you know, what's your goals? What do you hope to get out of this course? Or what do you hope to get out of this, this ski week? What are you looking for? You know, even the, the strongest of personalities loves to talk about themselves and will let you know what they're looking for and really feel special that you're taking that time to, to find out about them. And you can find little ways to, to work that into the, into the, uh, into the experience. And I find that goes a long way. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's a, there is a tendency to when we have these challenging people to push them away when the better strategy is to probably pull them towards us and make them our friends as much as we can. And the, you raise a great point about I find that people love to talk about three things, themselves, their kids and their dogs, if they have one. And if you can if you can get them talking about those things, then they're gonna feel start to feel a lot better about you. And to your point, if you can if you can challenge them a little bit, if you can make them a leader or give them some responsibility in a group, that that's uh, pretty helpful as well. One strategy that I have heard that I don't love is uh, I've heard a number of ski instructors over the years, they'll have somebody who just doesn't want to listen to them and they'll go out and they'll actually just try to destroy them. They'll take them down the run that's very difficult for them. They'll watch them blow up and then they'll you know show, the, show their, their student, hey, listen, look how easy I had skiing down there. Maybe you should pay attention because you were really struggling. And of course, that puts some person in a pretty difficult place. And I, and I think that can be a little bit of um, a natural reaction for us. Our instinct is when we're, when people are pushing us, we, we tend to want to push back when, you know, really what you're coaching is maybe just take a little, little step back and be a little bit flexible um, as they're pushing and, and then get them on your side. And then hopefully you can, you can turn the tide. Yeah, exactly. And that all leads, comes down to professionalism, right? Going out and, and shame that whole back to that shaming and blaming thing. If you're, if you're doing that to your, your guest, the person that's actually spending money to be, to scheme with you, you, you probably need to look at why you're, you're doing the job. And if you're mature enough to actually be in that position of responsibility, because that's really how you're going to get yourself into, into trouble, you and your guests both into, into trouble. So, um, yeah, I certainly agree with you that, uh, that's not the way to, to handle things. And you need to look at it from how can you uplift their experience and, and uh, cater to them in, in, you know, within reason as far as safety goes and risk management. With one guest, uh, I was operations manager and lead guide at a heli ski operation a number of years ago. And, and this guest was poking out and not really following the lines, not really following instructions. And finally I'd had enough of it. And, you know, after taking a more lenient, um, approach to it. And so he, he comes down to the pickup where the helicopter is about to come in. And I, I laid into him and, you know, in front of the other guests who were his friends. And, and I said, like, that is completely unacceptable what you just did and what you've been doing. And, and if you do that, any of that stuff, again, we're going in. And he, he looks at me, he's a, he's a smart guy, wealthy guy and uh, educated. And he, he smiles and he's like, well, that was our last run. We're going in now. <laughs> and I'm like, yep. I kind of just made myself look like an ass, didn't I? Yeah. Well, we're going in for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not even we're thinking done skiing. about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you want, might want to be uh, yeah, a little careful with when you deliver certain messages as well. Aaron, do you have any other advice for our listeners on how they can become more effective at it, inspiring people to follow them? And I actually got the idea for this topic. I was uh, down near Stanley Park in Vancouver a year ago, sitting on a bench, and I was watching a group of people uh, walk along, and, and they were kind of in their early 20s, and there's five of them, and they had their backpacks on. They were going to walk the seawall in Vancouver. And I thought, you know, one day one of them is going to be leading their friends on a bigger hike, probably on the North shore or maybe up around Whistler or maybe they'll go out to the Rockies and they're going to find themselves in that position. And, and how are they going to do it and how can they do that effectively? And so for the people that are out there that are maybe not professional guides or, or they are pros and they're trying to make themselves even better, even better. Do you have any other advice for them? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that brings up a whole lot of thoughts about, uh, 
development and, and, um, you know, I think about my son who's now 16 and he and his friends went up, uh, and did a day trip up Mount Curry this, this summer. It's great because there's cell service all the way up. So, um, felt comfortable letting them go up there. And there was, you know, most out of the five of them, at least four of them have great, um, the beginnings of great leadership skills, but there was no solid leader, um, you know, amongst, amongst the group, but hearing the stories at the end, you know, they did this 12 hour, 12 hour day. So lots of, you know, lots of time to go through different phases of, of success and, and failure and, and struggle for, for each of them. Uh, it was really cool to come back and hear their, their stories of how they supported each other through the different, the different experiences that they had along the way and who needed help when, and really all looked out for each other. And I think, you know, you talk about that group going out along the seawall and they're progressing to more challenging experiences of the, as, as life goes on. And that's the beginning of, of developing your leadership skills. And, um, and, and it, that's a, a, you know, great way to, a great way to start. And then I would say that, uh, you know, a leader doesn't know they're a leader in, until they are. So for that group, um, whether we're talking about your your group or or my son's group, no one went out there with the idea of being a leader. But when the time came when they needed to step up and 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 make some decisions for for the group um, to be successful, they found themselves in that position. And whether or not they're comfortable with it or not, um, it's how you execute it. And and having that, you know, when you're in that role, you ha- you hold power and recognizing that you hold power. Um, whether you want it or not is really important because you're in a really strong position to sway the decision-making of the group when you're standing in, in those shoes and that could sway it for the good or it could, could sway it for the bad. So understanding that, that responsibility is really important and going forward with the idea of, of humility, I think is, is something that we could all use to remember in this, in this day and age. Um, there's a lot of confidence out there, but it needs to be tempered with some with some humility. And uh, yeah, and I just think you go out and you do the best that you can and and try and take care of your your team and your people and and do the best job that you can and make the best decisions that you can in in the moment. and and it, remember that it is a long, long process to develop these skills um, and uh, and be patient with it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for this. Uh, this has been uh, this has been fantastic, and and um, wish you the best through the winter. Have a safe winter. Thanks, Jordy. It's been a really uh, great experience to think more about leadership and what it means. So I appreciate the opportunity. If you would like to find out more about Whistler Heli Skiing or the Canadian Ski Guide Association, which Aaron is the current president of, you can find links to both in the show notes. You can also hear Aaron speaking about the CSGA in an interview with our friends at the Avalanche Hour podcast. There is also a link to that interview in the show notes. So, Jordy, what stood out to you as you listened to Aaron? What does it take to get people to follow us? Well, Chris, let's start with why people need to follow someone. We do need leaders. Every group needs at least some level of direction, and even groups of leaders need leaders. This is something that Chris and I see working together on the board of directors of the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides. The board is comprised almost entirely of professional guides and instructors, so there's no shortage of leadership expertise. However, there still needs to be someone in the group to provide direction and get a consensus. Otherwise, nothing would get done. Pretty much every group of people is going to be the same. In some situations, things might be, appear to be working smoothly when things are going well. However, when you add in an element of stress, indecision, conflicting views, or conflict, a group can start to tear itself apart. This is where a good leader can provide the most value by providing direction. Another thing I took away from Aaron's interview was the idea of building credibility. If you're going to get people to follow you, they need to see you as someone who knows what they're doing. You also need to realize that being the leader is a huge responsibility, especially when there's a higher degree of risk involved. Leaders are responsible for keeping everyone organized, providing guidance, creating a safe environment, 
giving people support when it's needed, involving team members in decision-making in a way that's constructive, and overruling team members when it is needed. And finally, sometimes a leader has to make unpopular choices with their group, resulting in feelings of isolation. Chris, what did you get out of Aaron's interview? Well, all great points, Jordy. A key to reducing conflict and inspiring people to want to follow us is to remember that we need to use different leadership styles for different situations. This is something that Aaron touched on. In situations where action needs to be taken quickly or where there is a higher level of risk, it's common for leaders to take a more direct commanding approach. However, if a leader tried to use this approach all the time, the leader would probably get pushback, especially from people that don't like being told what to do. This is something that I found out firsthand. On the other end of the spectrum is a laissez-faire style. This is when a leader sits back and cedes control to the people that they are leading. This can work in low-risk situations and with people whom a leader can trust to make good decisions. In this instance, the leader is taking a more hands-off approach by only providing guidance when it is needed. This works when there is a little chance of getting into trouble or not meeting an objective. However, if the group is inexperienced or unable to make good decisions, giving a group too much control can backfire. An approach that splits the difference is a coaching style. This is where a leader uses their influence in a softer way to persuade the people they're leading to move in the right direction. This approach can be a little more subtle and relies on the belief that it is better to let people come to the right conclusion on their own as opposed to providing direct instructions. The downside of this can include the fact that some people still won't be able to make the right decisions. Also, in high-risk situations, the leader may still need to take a more authoritative, assertive approach. Overall, though, I find that the more often you can use approaches where you can make people feel good about what they have done and how they have done it, the more successful your team will be. And lastly, developing your leadership takes time. Like any skill, leadership skills aren't developed overnight. It is something that takes a conscious effort and reflection to develop. It also takes opportunity. This is something that Aaron also touched on. Being an effective leader is another topic that we will spend more time discussing as this podcast goes forward. This brings us to the end of another episode of Delivering Adventure. We would like to thank Aaron Tierney again for joining us. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you click the follow button in your podcast player so that you don't miss out on future episodes. We have a lot more great content coming your way. Take care and thanks for listening.